You're hanging out in the House of Sunny podcast, where it's always sunny, mostly because of your host, comedian and YouTuber, Sunny Loman. Want to know what Sunny and her friends are thinking about this week? Well, here she is, Sunny Loman. Hey, everybody, welcome to the House of Sunny podcast. Thanks for joining us. Today, really the only topic to talk about is Syria. Once again, the media is setting the narrative. <laughs> so we're going to be led by the nose and we're going to talk about Syria. What and about Epstein? Yeah, where's Epstein? Where's Vegas? About, where's Greta? Where's Russia? What about the people in the concentration camps on the border? Yeah, right. The kids in cages. Are they still in cages? We don't know. We moved uh, on. We've moved on. We're done with that. That was a week of our life and now it's over. So, but before we get into the news and stuff, I just wanted to make a recommendation. This sit, and I have to make this recommendation with an accent. I'm going to start talking like a southerner. Uh, mm. This city girl is watching the history of country music. <laughs> nice. <laughs> On PBS, Ken Burns documentary. And I love it. Like, I love it. And I just going to recommend it. Like probably a lot of my listeners like country. I didn't mm -hmm. grow up with country. But I'm finding that I actually know a lot of these songs, which kind of surprised me how much country is just in Americana and American life, even if you grow up in the city. I yeah, know a lot man. of these songs. And the, the documentary, it's kind of, in, in going through the history of the music, I don't know, it just makes me feel very kind of warm and fuzzy about my country. You know what I mean? And I think Southerners, for whatever reason, they tend to be more patriotic. I don't know what it is, but they tend to be, you know, country music. All those guys, they, f they fly the American flag. They're just very, uh, the, the people down there tend to go in the military. Even people from affluent households go into the military in the South. So it's a real patriotic region. And... I've always liked hillbilly music. I've always liked bluegrass. I have not always been a fan of country. I don't know how you feel about that. Since you're a musician, Doug, I don't know what you think about it all, but. Yeah, it's interesting. First of all, I, as far as Southern culture, there's a podcaster named, an historian named Brian McClanahan that I listen to, and he's a historian from the South, and he does a lot on Southern culture and and the history of the South. And so... That's actually fascinating. That kind of opened up my eyes to kind of part of what you're saying, Sonny, since I'm a northerner. Yeah. Um, he he really gets deep into that. But as far as country music goes, yeah. When I was a kid growing up, I really dismissed country because it seemed uh, it didn't really resonate with me culturally because I was more of a suburban city type guy. And um I didn't get it. And I thought the music was sort of simplistic. And that there's also different country isn't country. You know, there's varieties of it. There's like pop country, but then there's like the original country, um, you know, Hank Williams and the right. stuff. Right. I like the, the old 60s, stuff. The old, yeah, and the I, old and stuff. I like, I mean, and, I don't know how I got exposed to it, but I really liked Dolly Parton when I was a child. Um, oh yeah. I really, I, I would go to camp, you know, like, and, and they would play guitar around the campfire or something and they would play some of these old Hank Williams songs like Jambalaya and I don't know I got exposed to a bunch of stuff and I didn't even know it <laughs> and I'm like well, oh my god I know that one well yeah and there's a great history that comes out of you know where the music came from and um and but but there's also like I said there's this like pop country trajectory you know and then there's like the kind of the Merle Haggard and Hank Williams and Willie Nelson, the yeah. real musician, musicians. And um, so there, there, there's a lot to it. But I, as I've gotten older, I've really started to love countries, particularly old country and especially yeah. bluegrass music. I think music. the older and, you get, you get a little bit more empathy for light. You, you've just been through more tragedy and stuff. And country has a lot of that just, you know, tragedy. And then it's not necessarily a downer or something. It's just experiencing all the emotions of life, you know? Well, it's also Americana. Like you said, yeah. it's, um, there's so much about just kind of being American, 
you know, like that song that came out a couple of years ago where they're talking about beer on a Friday night, cold beer on a Friday night, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, I, I love that. And I, I realized that I didn't, I didn't know how much I appreciated that until I, well, I guess you know, I got older. You know what it is? You and I grew up in sort of the post, um, sixties revolution culture mm -hmm. in the North. Mm -hmm. And I think that the South, you know, really the, it's been so tarnished by just racism. Everybody down there is racist and stupid. And by the way, I heard that there was a hookworm infestation down there and like 40% of the population was affected by it and it made them kind of stupid and listless. Can you imagine an <laughs> entire region of people what? getting stupid and listless? And then what? of course we have this image of a Southerner being kind of stupid and listless, you know? And they're saying that it's kind of responsible for the reputation, the kind of dumb hillbilly reputation. It's because everybody had hookworm, especially the poorer people, because they'd run around barefoot and get it. Are 40, you making this up? No, I'm not. Google it. 40% of the population of the South had hookworm in like the 50s and that, that 40s, 50s time frame. Okay. And so I think that we have this impression of the South that they're all a bunch of bigots, that they're all stupid and so on. And I just feel like that's really unfortunate because there is so much color down there. You know what I mean? Like rich traditions and interesting cultural norms and, and bluegrass music to me and just old hillbilly country. It's so moving. It's so emotional. And it's fun, too. There's a lot of funny... Uh, it's like a huge part of the tradition to be sort of goofy with it. So it's really, I'm just going to play this one song. I, I had oh, never no. heard the song. I'm not going to play the whole song. I'm just going to play the beginning. I find this so interesting. It's a bluegrass song called Ruby and the banjos and everything, everything's playing super furiously in the back. And yeah. then they do, they say this, they hold this one note really long and then they don't just drop the note, they kind of fade off. And it just sounds like an emotional yell to me. It's so emotional, even though the song is very fast paced and kind of fun. And I mean, this, this song has been done many ways and it, it can be done more emotionally and slower, but I just really like, this is the Osborne Brothers. I'm gonna play it. Let's hang on. I'm gonna forward it. All they know you. Ruby, honey, are you mad at your man? Crazy banjo playing. Awesome as that. Yeah, man. So good. And then and then like just playing even more modern music like Waylon Jennings. And he, yeah. he's very like Hank Williams-ish. And in the background, he's doing like he's singing this slow you know, the music in the background is like a train rolling and he's singing this slow song. And then but in the background he's going, whoop, whoop. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and like Hank Williams used to do all that, whoop, you know. <laughs> uh, I love it. It's so emotional. And yeah. I'm just, I think that is um, a really, God, today's music is just lacking in that. It's so overproduced and all the sort of auto tune and the, oh, God. the so same unreal. chords and the lack of melody. And, and I'm going through this journey listening to this, you know, the history of country and it's pbs.org for anyone who wants to go listen to it. It's basically free on pbs.org and I'm loving it. I'm just loving it. And I'm just playing country music all over the house and 
Everyone's scared. <laughs> and by the way, I, that caricature of the South really actually pisses me off, particularly from Hollywood. I've noticed that like everyone, no, no matter where you are in the country, like where a plot's taking place, if someone, they want someone to portray someone as dumb, they always have a Southern accent. Right. Like even if like in Northern exposure, like the dumb people have Southern accents for some reason. It's just, it's such a dumb caricature when you consider that, you know, some of the most prominent, brilliant Americans are from the South, like uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, and George Washington. Yeah. Um, and, but we're just like, it's a really good people culture, just really yeah. good people. And, um, you know, yeah, cavalier culture, high level of kind of honor and morals and values. Um, who happen to own slaves. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Besides that. So let's get into the Syria thing. Um, just because we have to, because everybody's talking about it. And I want to approach this. First of all, I just like my main theme here is we don't know what the hell to think about Syria. Nobody that's listening to this knows what to think about Syria, really. I mean, maybe like I've sort of formed an opinion at this point, but to be honest with you, I could change this opinion tomorrow. <laughs> if somebody presented me with some piece of evidence that I didn't know before, I feel like this is very complex. It's, it's almost a centuries old issue. You kind of almost have to know the history of 3,000 years to understand what's going on here. Maybe, I mean, you don't really, but... The point is, is it's not just like, oh, the cur, what is it? We've stabbed them in the back, which is what the headline is. And yeah, as soon as somebody says that, everybody's like, oh my God, we're betraying. They're acting like, do you remember um, in Vietnam, we, the Hmong helped us fight the Viet Cong. And then we just kind of abruptly pulled out and left them to be sort of slaughtered. And it was awful. I mean, they really were slaughtered. But we weren't fighting Turkey. Like we're never, we were never fighting Turkey. So the Turkey is not our Turkey, the Turkey. <laughs> we're fighting the Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Basically Erdogan is a big fat Turkey. Listen, I hate, I hate Erdogan and he's taken what was a very proud and secular, uh, co proudly secular Muslim nation and turned it into, uh, is just destroying it with totalitarian Islamic uh, dictatorship type of style government they've they have uh, arrested judges and journalists probably they murder people um i don't think that's a stretch it's and, a bad and yet country we're an ally, and yet we're a nato ally of They're, turkey for the yeah, last seven years i mean probably they shouldn't be in nato i don't know why we would ever come to turkey's defense and we are promised to do that in a treaty turkey could say hey the kurds are attacking us you need to attack the kurds yeah. Like legally they have that right, everybody. So if we have a problem with that, which I think we should have a problem with that, we should not be, they should not be in NATO. Definitely they should be getting out of NATO. So, but that's kind of not, so that's, but that's somewhat relevant. that's part of the relevant. complexity of the whole situation. It's totally yeah, relevant right. because this goes off in all these different directions, right? It's not right. just A plus B is C, you know? Right. Now, last week we talked about Douglas Murray's book and he, he says there are two kind of societal pathologies going on right now. One is that we claim to know more than we do. And the second one is that things we all knew for sure yesterday, we are claiming to not know anymore, like that men and women are different, stuff like that. Um, hmm. But the first one applies here, that we think we know more than we do. The media says, stab them in the back. They're stabbing the Kurds in the back. And we all, like within five minutes, Everybody on Facebook had an opinion about it and everybody on Twitter had an opinion and everybody in the news had an, an opinion and it, and, and it was almost universally, how dare we, how dare we leave the Kurds to be attacked and slaughtered by the Turks? I think we can all agree we don't like the Turks, but who are the Kurds? What do we owe them? What promises have been made? Nobody's really made a case to me that our, it's clear our interests are not really involved there. So the only reason why we would stay would be to protect this group of people who people say, oh, they did us this big favor by fighting ISIS. But I think we did them a favor <laughs> by coming yeah. in and fighting ISIS, right? I mean, it's not like they didn't get anything out of it. And, right. and I, I my, the analogy that works for me on this is like they had a plumbing problem 
we saw it, we came in and, and we were being affected by it. Like we're the neighbors and, and like it was flooding our basement too. So we come over and we not only repair the plumbing, we replace all the pipes with gold. And then we want to leave and they say, hey, our roof's leaking. How dare you leave? Like what do, what do we have to do with their roof? We have nothing to do with the roof. And I, I, I'm so sick of this idea that America needs to just be there no matter, you know, just because something bad could happen if we're not. It's right. just not our fucking responsibility. We have got to stop looking at the world that way. And it's been decades of foreign policy that we sacrifice our money, and this money, $8 trillion, Trump said we have spent in the Middle East in the last couple of decades. $8 trillion. Dollars, and we are in Syria. What for? Like we shouldn't have gotten involved in the first place, but okay, we're involved. So when can we get out? I, I've asked this of several people who who seem to think that what Trump is doing is horrible. Okay, if we have to stay in, when can we get out? What are the conditions under which we can get out? And they're just completely vague with answers, just vague yeah. answers about, well, we have to protect the Kurds. Well, for how long? Do we They've need been to fighting the Turks for decades? centuries so what when's a good time and and how do we get out protecting them like how do we do that there's just no way to do it so they kind of at some point they have to be on their own they were on their own before we got there why is it why we came in to help out with isis and we crushed them we gave them money and guns and materials and tanks well, we helped to create isis remember too well we I did mean, that so, so it kind of was our responsibility so we come in we crush them Thanks, so thanks Bush and Obama, right? How, why we invaded Iraq in the first place? What a giant two-decade mess. This is going to yeah, go down well, in history as what were they thinking? Well, remember, we started off by we were going after these guys in Afghanistan and these Al-Qaeda, these Sunni Muslims who had apparently been behind 9-11. And so there was like a few hundred guys that involved the Saudi government and a few hundred guys. So then we go over there. Next thing you know, we're attacking Iraq. <laughs> right. Then we attack Iraq, destabilize that country, which is a secular dictatorship. Then we end up oh, through uh, under Obama. We're overthrowing secular dictators in Libya and Egypt and Syria. And we're supporting who? Al we're supporting Al Qaeda and ISIS type guys. Right. To to overthrow these secular dictators. There are so, almost no good people in the Middle East. I mean, they're just you can't ally with people and go, oh, that guy's a good guy. I, su I support these commie Kurds against Turkey. I mean, who gives a shit? I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, but really, are, are you sure they're good? Are you sure these Kurds are like this pure, pristine group of communist Muslims? Sound They sound great. And here we're we're supporting at one point we're supporting Al Qaeda ISIS types fighting against Damascus you know against the Syrian Assad you know Assad yeah. so now it's up to the Kurd what the Kurds should do is go back to Syrian Assad and ally with him and say hey we want to you know we don't like ISIS we don't like the Turks you got to come and help but anyways it's their problem right. It's not our perpetual we, problem. Why are we even in the Middle East? The what only, are we doing there? The only country that might have less to do in Syria is like Mexico. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what, what are we doing? So, okay, so we're there. We got in. And, and I understand that when you go into a place and you make a mess, it's nice not to leave a mess behind. But I think the mess was there before we got there. This particular mess, this Kurd versus Turkey mess, everybody is saying... You know, I can't verify this because I'm not an expert, but this is what I'm hearing that this mess has been going on for a long time. And it's really not our job to clean it up, especially when Turkey is our legal ally. And we may not like that, but that's what the treaty says. So Congress needs to act if, if that's what you want. You know, anyway, the well, Kurds don't Trump even tried, have Trump floated getting out of NATO. And that was like he dropped a bomb on, yeah, on the world. Remember out. that? Yeah, it's it, it, so. Um, Our foreign policy is a complete and utter disaster. It's a mess. It's been a mess for decades. We are facing the consequences of all of our actions throughout the years and the decades. The Middle East is not simple. It's complicated. But now at this point, 
we just have to look at it and assess like, what are our interests? Yeah. It's almost like that. It's almost forget everything else. What are our interests today? Because, you know, there's just no way to make a change without a little pain. And people are just going to, other countries are going to have to step up and deal with their problems. And Europe has more interest in here than we do. They need to step in and deal with this, whatever. I mean, I don't even care. And so what bothers me the most is that the media can come out with a headline and everybody is suddenly an expert. And I've kind of formed an opinion, but I, I took a couple of days to do that. And I read a lot and I read stuff from both sides and I waited because I realized like, I don't really know what's going on here. Maybe what he's doing is wrong. Maybe he should have done it differently. I mean, Turkey has already attacked them now, I guess, but again, that's a headline. I'd need to know the facts. Where have they attacked them? What happened? Were the, did the Kurds provoke it? We don't know. We don't know anything. We know what the media is telling us. And the media has Trump derangement syndrome so bad. And they've lied about everything. So they're, ab- they're 100% untrustworthy. 100%. And yet people still read these headlines and they just go, oh, oh my gosh. We're yeah, stabbing what- the Kurds in the back. It's like, who says who? CNN? I mean, even Fox said it. I'd be like, maybe. I don't know. Like, right. I, I need a little more information. But remember the conflict of interest, which is that, you know, we have a massive defense and military infrastructure that makes trillions and trillions of dollars off this stuff. And so, right. you know, there's a huge conflict. I mean, it's very hard to really know and understand what's going on, except as a citizen, you have to step back and say, let's go back to like first principles here. Like, what's the purpose of our military and our foreign policy. It's not to be a global policeman. I mean, we have, I think we have um, over 200 bases. We have like tens of thousands of troops all over the world and um, over a hundred different countries. I mean, it. what are we doing? Like, why are we doing this? Why are we spending all this money? Who's benefiting from it? It's not me. I mean, I'm more worried about like just like we can't be responsible for every poor mother with a child who wants to live in freedom. I mean, as far as they understand freedom, like there's seven billion people on this earth, and we're a few hundred million. It's just not our responsibility. I mean, it really comes down to altruism, and as objectivists who you know support self-interest in foreign policy, which actually, when this country was founded, that was the norm. I mean, if you read anything that Washington or Jefferson said about foreign policy, it wasn't, gee, let's go out and make sure that Spain doesn't hurt anybody <laughs> in Brazil, yeah. you know? Right. I mean, it what, was good what luck is, with all that. Yeah. In fact, they were, they were more afraid of a standing army and w- they were afraid that, you know, if we had a standing army, you know, someone would want to use it and we'd get entangled in Europe and we'd get entangled in military adventurism. And that was the last thing they wanted uh, us to do. It's like quicksand and we're just deep in it and we have to get out. We have to get out. Um, And here's what Trump said in his press conference. And I I really like what he said here. Um, You're not going to like this if you have TDS because anything he says is a problem for you. (laughs) I just... I just don't understand TDS. I think by now, like, he's not that bad, guys. Like, he's just proven that he's not that bad. Today or yesterday, he signed a bill making it hard for federal agencies to bully and harass Americans by giving them certain rights. Like, you have a right to know the law before you're bullied and harassed and fined out of existence. And the agencies are now responsible for making you aware of it. And so you can take them to court and be like, hey, they didn't make me aware of it. And then your fines go away. So it gives you a a real nice legal standing against a harassing federal agency. Mm -hmm. He just signed that yesterday. That's great legislation. Or it's not even legislation, sorry. It's an executive order. It's an executive order. And God damn it, Congress, you know, that the scary thing about that is it's an executive order. And so the so, you know, if Elizabeth Warren gets in, she can just I, I would bet you the Democrats would come in and take every executive order Trump did and just undo it. They wouldn't even read it. They'll just immediately undo it. Like the first 10 days, Elizabeth Warren will just be signing undo the old stuff. And, and they'll, they'll pronounce on television how great they are, that they've undone, 
you know, four, eight years of Trump. By okay. the way, can, that's a I, prediction. I, I, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, Pat Buchanan had a great article about the whole Syrian thing. And no, I didn't. I don't that. know. This is he he wrote some. I mean, this is a fantastic summary of what's going on in the Middle East. He says, consider well, today. Well, the- before you read that, I was just going to read President Trump's press. Oh, conference. please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. OK, so here's what he said. And this is I don't believe this is an exact quote. I saw this transcription and I watched it. It's really close, but it's not exactly it's not exactly mm-hmm. what he said. And and um I think they cleaned up some of his repetition or whatever, but okay, here we go. The Kurds are fighting for their land. Just so you understand, the United States was supposed to be in Syria for 30 days. That was many years ago. We stayed and got deeper and deeper into battle with no aim in sight. When I arrived in Washington, ISIS was running rampant in the area. This is, by the way, he said this extemporaneously. This is not a speech. We quickly defeated 100% of the ISIS caliphate, including capturing thousands of ISIS fighters, mostly from Europe. But Europe did not want to want them back. They said, you keep them, USA. I said, no, we did you a great favor, and now you want us to hold them in U.S. prisons at tremendous cost. They're yours for trials. They again said no, thinking, as usual, that the U.S. is always the sucker on NATO, on trade, on everything. The Kurds fought with us, but were paid massive amounts of money and equipment to do so. They have been fighting Turkey for decades. I held up this fight for almost three years, but it is time for us to get out of these ridiculous endless wars, many of them tribal, and bring our soldiers home. We will fight where it is to our benefit and only fight to win. Turkey, Europe, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Russia, and the Kurds will now have to figure the situation out. And when they want to do... What they want to do with the captured ISIS fighters in their neighborhood. They all hate ISIS, have been enemies for years. We are 7,000 miles away and will crush ISIS again if they come anywhere near us. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. What's wrong with what he just said? That's like the textbook America first foreign policy. Yeah. We're 7,000 miles away. We have nothing to do with this. ISIS is gone. Now, if leaving those prisoners unattended leads to, he said he um, took out the really bad guys and he is, uh, you know, he didn't say where, but they're probably in Guantanamo at this point. Um, but no, he a took, lot of them are being held by Turkey. I mean, they're being well, held he didn't say where the they country. were, but he said that they, they removed the really bad guys, the head guys, I'm sure. And if the rest get out, if something happens, if ISIS comes back, I guess we'll have to go back in and crush them. But that doesn't justify endlessly being in the Middle East babysitting a bunch of freaking prisoners when it's not our problem. It's Turkey's problem. It's Assad's problem. It's Russia's problem. It's Iraq's problem. So I exactly. think he's right. And he campaigned on this. So this is a campaign promise. And it's one thing about his campaign I liked. Yeah, exactly. He was promising to end endless wars. And he made fun of Hillary for wanting to enforce a no fly zone in Syria and elsewhere. He made it in the debates. He, you know, joked about it. Like, what what are we doing that for? What, you know, and it's funny how won. many people on the right uh, don't support this pull out. I, I just it's kind of unfathomable. We don't have unlimited wealth. And even if we did, like, it's just it's not theirs. It's ours. And people voted for him and they voted for this. So yeah, well, there's a big part of the right, like the kind of the neocon right that supports this sort of like but American even the hegemon- non-neocons. Like, I, I mean, a lot of people that I wouldn't consider to be normally neocons. Uh-huh. Um, but I am seeing with the immigration issue and with this issue, it, it really is, as Rand said, there's rampant selflessness going on in our foreign policy. (laughs) Like what we need is some selfishness, some self-interest. We need to proclaim loudly and proudly. We have a right to our wealth. We don't owe anybody shit, you know? Yeah, exactly. We don't owe anybody a country. We don't owe anybody our money and our soldiers. Honestly, people, things have, they have, people have been brainwashed into accepting this. So he was talking about, uh, I don't know if you saw this speech, but he was talking about how the the um, soldiers coming back in caskets and how emotionally devastating it was for him to see that and see the parents, you know, crying and screaming at their and he and I was like, yeah, exactly. You know, like, would you People send your die. kid over there? Yeah. And and I saw so I was reading an article about this, right, about how he was. 
sympathizing with this, saying this has got to end. We can't do this anymore. And the article, the tone of the article was Trump ghoulishly discusses soldiers coming home in caskets. And it was all about how he really had no empathy for these people. And he's a sociopath. And how dare he talk sort of morbidly about, you know, the parents screaming and crying and jumping up on the coffins to get to their kids and stuff like that. Yeah. And and I was like, how? OK, yeah. <laughs> how else do you make it unabstract for people? Yeah. I mean, you have to make it unabstract. People would you should somebody should anybody die for the Kurds against the Turks in Syria, the commie Kurds? Should any I mean, I'm not a fan of Turkey. Don't get me wrong, but what are we do what are we doing there? Look well, at a mother's Kurds, face. Like, like I have a Marxist. daughter. Look in a mother's face and say your child must be sacrificed for the Kurds in Syria because we owe them something. We owe them a roof when we've already given them golden pipes for their plumbing. Yeah, oh, or take, take out the money directly from your paycheck. So whoever's working out there, you know. Well, the funny thing is it is don't directly. Just extractly pay, don't extractly pay. Ta- yeah, right. but I'm saying, you know, actually take the money directly from your check and send it. Like pay to the order of the Kurds. <laughs> You know, send the money directly to them. And by the way, like risk your son's life and your daughter's life, you know, and you, this is this is such armchair like it, the whole thing in the Middle East makes me sick because it's almost a cartoon to Americans. This is something you watch on TV. You know, war is something right. like a video game. Um, I just I did the math. Eight trillion dollars is twenty six thousand dollars per person. Twenty six thousand dollars per person. Can I have my money back? <laughs> that that's what I paid for my college education. Um, yeah, it's just it's just not right. I just don't know how we get out of this without a little bit of pain, but I think we've got to get out. It's just not in our interests, and we have to stop throwing our soldiers all around the earth, and. Yeah. I had a thought I was going to go somewhere with it. And then you were talking about Buchanan's article. But um, but yeah, we need to be more self-interested. And I think that what people are thinking is like, if you are walking down the street and you see a guy beating up a, a guy, you see one guy beating up like a like a kid, let's say, would you stop it? Would you do something? You know, good people, you, we would, right? In fact, if you walked by and were like, I don't care, I would look at you and go, Ugh, like, you got a problem. How could you not try to step in and stop, you know, a bully or something or a, or a bad guy from, from hurting someone smaller than him? And so I think, like, your human good instincts are that we need to protect the underdog in this situation, the Kurds. And since the Kurds are kind of our friend, it's like seeing our friend get beat up. Um, and that somehow that means we should step in, that it's honorable to step in. And I feel like that's been 100 years of our foreign policy. Maybe not 100, but at least 70. That we're just out there, you know, playing the, the high school jock who's got to step in and stop the bullies in order to be good. Yeah, and that's that's a kind and generous interpretation of what we've been doing as far as like, you know, right. we've oh, been doing we're trying some to damage help these out people. there too, but we create these things and, you know, they're it it's you know, I think there's a lot of forces in play in terms of like people who want to continually uh enforce or project American power and, you know, for financial gain and, you know, for their own power lusting reasons and a belief that somehow we can, you know, impart American culture and Western ideals to these people, um, which again is not our job and is a complete sacrifice and a waste of money and people and is sickening. Well, I think what it comes down to is it's just not a government's role. It should never be a government's role to be out there being the good guy for on behalf of its citizens. Like when there's a hurricane, we should pour money into helping people survive it. 
rather than local people kind of getting together and figuring out their own problems. Donations go and pouring in to help people who have been through a disaster or something. Instead, the federal government jumps in. Why? Why, why do we, why should the federal government give hurricane relief funds? Why does FEMA even exist? Right. Like this, it's all been nationalized. It's all been nationalized. And th this should be local people and voluntary charity. It shouldn't be the federal government. And then we're doing that same thing worldwide. Oh, you have a disaster? We'll help. It's not the government's job to help, especially the federal government's. Well, it's funny. There's more of a justification for us to help our own people in a hurricane zone than there is to help the Kurds or the Vietnamese. Or Absolutely. Whomever, but I think you know? both, but both are wrong. Both is right. using federal funds. Nobody gets to vote on it. Using federal funds to... What's creepy about Syria, too, Congress didn't even vote on this, <laughs> you know? A president made a decision to get us involved in this, in this mess. A president is making a decision to get us out. Congress has never voted on it. Right. They've completely delegated their constitutional authority to make war to the president over the last, what, 50 years, the especially since the Congress War Powers Act. The only thing Congress is doing is impeaching the president. That's all they do. They do nothing. So Before we have that, we're ruled by Mueller. executive order. It was the Mueller. You know, all the Congress's job appears to be taking down a president, and everything else is done by administrative, uh, rogue leftist administrative deep state, the president and the Supreme Court. There's no legislature anymore. No, there's not. So, but I. You have written some stuff on judgment, and we got a message, Doug and I, that they wanted us to talk about how to judge people, if we had any comments on that. And I think it kind of, it's the same thing as judging a news story like this. First of all, you need a lot of context. And like Douglas Murray says, we are pretending to know things we don't know. You don't know jack shit about Syria, everybody. Like maybe you know more today after two days of news and commentary than you did two days ago. But when these headlines first started coming out, you didn't know anything. Well, and where have we all been for the last three years? Where's the media been? You know, isn't it isn't it funny that, you know, we have Americans coming home in caskets. We're spending billions of dollars in the Middle East. Right. And, you know, with the Saudis and Yemen, we're we're in Afghanistan, we're in Iraq. Um you know, all to no avail. We're in Syria and we're doing all these things. We've had wars going on for 20 years. We spent, like you said, $8 trillion. We've got tens of thousands of dead. We've killed millions of people over there and nothing's better. The Taliban has more land. Iraq is a mess. Syria's in a civil war. Um, the Saudis are, you know, in, in a genocide against the Yemenis. And so nothing's gotten better in 20 years. And where's everybody been? Then Trump wants to finally pull us out of something. Just stop one thing. And by the <laughs> way, we're not even really pulling out. He's just sending troops to, I think, southeast Syria. We're just getting out of that region. So we're really not even, I mean, this is sort of like, you know, restricting the growth and government spending. You know, it's not like you're actually cutting government spending, right? So we're, we're not even doing that much. This is a minor step in the right direction to just say, in principle, we've got to stop this. And look at the pushback he's getting just on that. Suddenly, everyone's interested in Syria. Suddenly, everybody's an expert on Syria and is concerned about our relationship with Kurdistan. I mean, or the Kurds. I mean, come on. There is um, no Kurdistan. There's no country. These are just bands of people, tribal it, warfare. And we're going to get involved in that? Yeah, we're going to get I, involved in tribal wars that have been going on for hundreds yeah. of years. Okay, Between so but my point is, my point is like, People didn't, yeah, I agree. Where was the media and where was the plan for pulling out in a way that was acceptable to people? Nobody was coming up with that. What's What was the objective to begin with? Where, where's Congress putting together some sort of plan for Syria so that we can get out but not betray anybody? I mean, right? There was no plan. Two years ago, ISIS was defeated. And two years later, we're saying, I think we're going to leave this area. And the Kurds are going into Turkey and attacking and coming back over the border and hiding out in Syria under the protection of the U.S. And Turkey's our ally. 
So it does kind of look bad, you know? Imagine if the headline was United States backing terrorists that attack Turkey and then shelter in the United States, you know, for the, under the United States um, protection in right. Syria. Like, what if that's the headline? <laughs> Right. And, and there's no good time. You know, what, no uh, these, all these people, uh, you know, this is not a good time to pull out. When will it be a good right. time? What is our strategic objective? And again, you know, you can, I think, I, you know, I forgot who it was, but this is like a bedrock principle. I think it was Kurt Schlichter was saying this. It's like the bedrock principle of military engagement is have a clear objective. You have to have a clear goal in mind when you take on any action, whether in life, you know, much less a military operation, or you're going to lose. If your goal is just, well, we're just going to be there and kind of police the area. Um, if you're going to send your military in, you have to say, this is the goal. This is what we're trying to achieve. And then you put together a plan to do that. And then you're done. Well, um, it seems like we did that and we were done two years ago, but because us leaving will potentially damage somebody, we have to stay forever. I, yeah, which, I mean, that's which literally what you're, mean. that's literally what people are asking for, because there's no, there's no time that we will leave and leave the Kurds strong enough to defend themselves. Turkey's a very big, powerful country, and there's no future where Kurds are more powerful. And so anytime we left, it would just, it would be a brawl. And I don't know, I just can't care about it. I, I'm not trying to be the guy walking by like a, a small kid getting beat up by a big kid, but it's just not America's responsibility. No, what you're saying is not you're walking by and someone's getting beaten up and you can do something simple to help. What you're saying is a guy is beating up someone 7,000 miles away <laughs> and you have to risk your son's life to protect them. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference here qualitatively. You're not just walking by someone in your neighborhood and you well, can just push a button and stop it. Well, the idea is that the U.S. It. is invincible and that we can go over there and Turkey can't hurt us. And, you know, that we're powerful, so we should use our power for good. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's just bullshit. It's bullshit. Anyway, but my point about the judgment that I really want to drive home is Douglas Murray's point. You think you know more than you do, and you don't know, and everybody needs to chillax. I mean, these headlines come up and everyone goes crazy and they have an opinion way before they should. And that drives me more crazy than anything else. It's not that I maybe disagree with you. It's like, whoa, 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 hold your horses, you know? Yeah, right, right. And, um, and it's not like if you said something tomorrow, I couldn't change my mind on this. Like there could, I admit, there could be something I don't understand about this. Some promise that was made. Like if we made a specific promise and, and that was done in writing and I could see, oh yeah, well, we are reneging. I, I would say that's wrong and we should go ahead and fulfill that promise if it's fulfillable and then leave. But so far, I've not seen that. I've just seen this kind of fuzzy, no, we just need to be there in case the turkey wants to attack them. It's just not our fight, folks. So, but the judgment issue, you got to, the same thing goes when you're judging people. And this is what this guy was asking about. And I just don't jump to conclusions. That's number one. I try to give the benefit of the doubt. I look for facts. I have... I have, you know, red flags, but I don't necessarily act on those. And as you have endlessly pointed out when it comes to judgment, it depends on why you're judging the person or the event. And that's the first question you ask. What, what does this have to do with me? What am I doing here? Right. And it's yeah, the same that's... with Syria and it's the same with judging your, your neighbor. Yeah, it's there. You never start with how do you judge something? You start with why are you judging it? Like what what interest do you have? And, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, another person, you don't say, well, how do I judge that guy? You say, why am I judging him? Am I marrying him? Right. You know, am I marrying this woman? Am I buying a hot dog from them? Am I buying a piece of pizza from them? You know, um, why? Why do I care about this? Um, you know, if you're interviewing someone for a job, and they have, and you know, you're going to hire this person and they have tattoos and they're wearing a biker outfit or something. 
you know, okay, that's, you, you wouldn't want that person for the job, but if you're going and you're buying a hot dog, I don't care if the guy has tattoos, yeah. you know, or like what his personal philosophy is. Um, I don't care, you know. And so, you've made this argument over and over with how to judge Trump, which I think is critical because um, objectivists tend to want to sort of judge Trump in a vacuum, but that's really inappropriate. Trump comes in a context we're judging him to do a specific job. First of all, it's an executive job. He's not, we're not picking him to be our philosopher king, <laughs> you know? Right, and, which is what Rand said. Right. And she we're not actually, picking a philosopher king. Right. She explicitly said that when she was discussing the whole Nixon uh, McGovern thing. When you're judging Nixon, you're judging him as, and, and oh, Douglas Murray is so good at this too. He always says, compared to what? That's compared the question we have exactly. to ask. Is America good or bad? Well, compared to what? Is our history the history of evil slavery? Well, compared to what? That is the key question with when you're judging someone like Trump in, in the context of this guy has a job, it's a specific job, compared to what? Well, in this current context, it's compared to Hillary Clinton. <laughs> right. That was the choice. Right. Exactly. And it's, it's, you know, you're always judging these things in a context. You're not judging someone in a moral vacuum, like you're judging them whether to go to heaven or not. And you can you're even ju judge Trump in compared to what, compared to what other Republican would you have preferred? Because honestly, I think no one could do the job he's doing. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, when you're getting into these concrete factors, then it's not only, you know, it's what is the job we're asking him to do? Can he do that job compared? Who are the other candidates? Is it Hillary Clinton? You know, like what are all the different issues that are going to come up? Supreme Court justices. You know, that's a that's an extremely important uh, job that he's going to be picking Supreme Court justices that are going to affect our lives for, what, 30, 40 years, possibly. Do we want Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Warren picking Supreme Court justices that might uh, overthrow the First Amendment or the Second Amendment? No, I'd rather have Trump picking those Supreme Court justices. If that's all I knew, I would vote for him just just because of that. Just like Rand said, hey, Nixon at the time, she said Nixon will buy us some time. You know, Gov McGovern is fully statist. Nixon is just, you know, moderate and he's going to be picking Supreme Court justices. So for the next four years, that's what we care about to get to the next election, to buy us some time. Yeah. You know, this are, you don't just say, well, you know, we just analyze Trump's pathologies out of context. Like the guy's a liar. OK, all politicians are liars. You know, he uh, is boorish. OK, well, maybe that's a benefit in some circumstances. Right. He's very honest. Maybe we need someone who's boorish sometimes to deal with, you know. He's certainly like, more transparent than any president in my lifetime. Like if I was hiring someone to MC my wedding, I probably wouldn't want a boorish person. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like why is boorishness in and of itself necessarily bad? You know, judgment is always in a context. Like why are you judging the person? What is going on and what are all the relevant factors? And what are the, like you said, compared to what? Right. And, and I, I'm so sick of that. I, and the thing about Trump, I, and I didn't really mean to make this show about Trump, I mean, yeah, for certain jobs, I would never hire Trump. It's not like I think, I mean, it's like if you support Trump at all, you're smeared with this idea that he's like your God King. Yeah. And I don't think of him like that at all. I don't worship him. I didn't like him in the primary. I was a Cruz supporter, but looking at kind of, here, here's what, here's what I, the insight that I've had since he has been elected. I knew that things had changed for the worse under Obama. I knew that he had changed our culture. I knew that race relations were worse. I could see that locally, the local politicians had become bolder and more corrupt, more sort of overtly corrupt. And they didn't care. They became more lawless. I saw that with mm -hmm. city councils in Minneapolis, um, where before there was a certain kind of, uh, propriety that people felt like we need to at least pretend that we're not corrupt. Yeah. And that we're, we're sort of uh, impartial and part, you know, partisan or whatever. And once we're in office, you know, that we represent all of our constituents, not just Democrats or whatever. And under Obama, that was all thrown out. And I saw firsthand because I, 
interact with business people in Minneapolis, or I did at the time, that they were breaking laws and they're just like, well, sue us. I mean, they, they really were just, they were so emboldened to become lawless. And I think that probably happened in other very liberal cities as well, as we can see now with like Portland, the way they're backing Antifa and, and how New York arrests anyone who defends themselves against Antifa. And, um, and now they've banned speech in New York. I mean, the crazy stuff that the left has done post Obama, during Obama and post Obama. And Trump, I feel, really let the cat out of the bag. Their hatred for him has caused them to really reveal themselves. And as a former Cruz supporter, I don't think he could have handled this. I don't think, I almost think you have to be a boorish narcissist in the extreme <laughs> in order yeah. not to be like, to have been reduced to a puddle at this point by the relentless attacks against him, not just socially, but, you know, imagine this for a moment that the media has been attacking him nonstop. He's been attacked legally nonstop with very scary, all powerful FBI, CIA, deep state, you know, attacks. That's scary. And not only him, but his family and his friends and anyone who works with him is a potential target for going to prison because you worked with Donald Trump. I mean, look at what happened to Flynn. Yep. So imagine persevering through all of that. That's kind of incredible that he's still sort of good natured. I was watching the press conference where he was talking about his deal with Japan and he was, oh, and the, and the one where he was signing the regulation thing where people were given the right to, um, the, the agencies were responsible for making people aware of the regulations before they find and, and harass people. And he is so good natured and friendly with everybody and joking around. And I'm like, I can't even believe that he's, he's still kind of a benevolent, <laughs> yeah friendly guy who's joking and and yeah, he said he's used to it now. He clearly loves children. There were some babies up there. And and you can't fake love of children. I'm sorry, but I'm a mom. I've seen, I've seen mothers try to fake loving their own children, and they don't, you know? <laughs> um, nice. So it's, uh, I just yeah. think he's the right man for the right time. I don't think he's someone I would have chosen. I never, I didn't choose him. But it turns out that he's the right guy for the right time. The masses understood better than me. You know, the market, I guess, understood better than me what this country needed. And yeah. I don't think he's the one who's responsible for the left completely losing their shit and going crazy. I think they were like that. Yeah, and they were. St I mean, they're they're Obama extended the 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 sense and corruption of the Chicago political machine to the nation. I mean, he, you know, it's a sort of a Marxist principle to politicize everything, politicize every aspect of life. And, you know, we saw this in the Obama administration where, like you said, of course, all of the agencies of the government are political by definition, but there was always a sense that you at least needed to pretend or there, there needed to be some sense of propriety with regard to, you know, div, you know, the FBI's role or the IRS's the IRS, role. The IRS, that really shocked me. I, I've, that, I was really shocked that he was able to politicize the IRS. Well, and they, of course they do. But the fact that they got caught red handed and got away with it. Yeah. Was frightening to me because we yeah. all know that, you know, this happens. But the fact that they so obviously had prevented conservative and Tea Party organizations from forming those nonprofits. And it affected the, the election. No, they it absolutely affected the it, election. Absolutely. Uh, did. And and 2012. And and yet, you know, of course, crickets because the media, because the liberals control the media. So we and now we've seen not just the inherent bias that we knew always existed, but now we're hearing actual uh, explicit recognition by the liberals themselves. Yes, we need to be part of the resistance. You know, we in the media, we need to fight this president. We can no longer just, you know, even pretend that we're unbiased. And, you know, we're seeing this, you know, everywhere now that there, the media has yeah. taken 
have, are putting their thumbs on the scale now. Yeah. They're not even pretending to be objective. Right. The comparison of, you know, they're acting so righteous, like they're, they're battling Hitler. And it's the most absurd thing in the world that Trump is even, uh, a, you know, a 30 yes. second, I, I don't know, just the tiniest tinge of somebody like Hitler is, it's so absurd. Um, they, they tell themselves this in order to justify how crazy they've gotten. But anyway, so I think everybody, I just like, I really just want people to calm down and wait and take a pause, take a breath that goes for before you judge an issue like this and when, and before you judge people. And we're also seeing that on social media where there's this knee jerk judging, unfriending, like, you know, and, and this idea that when someone disagrees with you, what you should do is pounce on them rather than kind of be curious and try to convince them and have a conversation with them. And, and what maybe thing that, learn something, learn something or convince them. I mean, people can change their minds. So just because I have an opinion that I've formed now on Syria for two days, doesn't mean I'm not open to, you know, some piece of evidence that would change my mind. And I don't, I admit, I don't know all the facts. I'm a two day armchair philosopher on Syria right now. Well, I know jack I, I, I shit, wanna, actually. I want to make a broad point about something you just said, which is that you're open to facts. This is the 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 hallmark of the man of reason, you know, and the person who uses induction is being open to facts, which can alter your judgment. It's you know, not when it's not bad to change your uh, mind. Like it doesn't mean you you were flawed or you're this. I, I don't know why people are so afraid of making mistakes and being wrong about something. Well, again, this is like again, it's. You know, rationalism is this idea that you have a formula that, you know, uh, all people of this kind are evil. Right. And so instead of saying, well, what are the facts and like, what are the circumstances and why am I making this evaluation? You say, no, all people of this category are evil. Therefore, anyone who seems like that, they get put in the box. And that's a rationalistic, deductive way to think. It's not saying, let me collect facts, which can alter my judgment. And then, you know, over time you can induce principles and generalize about certain things, but you always recognize that new facts can change your principles. They can change, um, uh, your evaluation of people, um, or of circumstances change. And so, you know, taking into account all those factors makes you open to reason. It doesn't mean that you're a subjectivist and right. that that you could just entertain the possibility of anything. Anything could happen. No, you, you're not saying that. You're saying there are certain circumstances when new facts could alter my judgment, like this foreign policy stuff, which is extremely complicated and extremely uh, difficult to figure out. And there's and we, and all we sorts really, of factors we, there, involved. There's not only a lot of factors involved, there's stuff going on behind the scenes we don't know about. You know, agreements, conversations. If someone could show me that Trump made promises and he's welching on those promises, like that might change my mind. But so far, I haven't heard that from anybody. Um, so interesting that you said like the rationalist puts people in a box. Like, and I think they've done that with Trump. A lot of people, it's like, well, Trump bad. And so really anything he does is bad. We look for a way to make it bad. And, and I... I'm more interested, I, I don't know, like something happened this morning that made me think about this. Somebody in my circle shared a video by a white separatist. Um, I guess that guy's name is Jared Taylor. You ever heard of that guy? No. He's like kind of an older dude, kind of creepy. <laughs> he, he reminds me of like a preacher, like one of those mm -hmm. old 80s evangelical preachers. Yeah. And he's a white, he's a white separatist, also possibly not so much a supremacist, but he acknowledges IQ, like that Asians have higher IQ than white people, but that white yeah. people have a higher IQ than black people. So like he's kind of hyper into that, but he believes that everybody should just be with their own kind and that everybody wants to be with their own kind anyway. And I don't agree with that. And so that's white separatism, I guess, or race separatist. Because I think you could be black. A lot of black people feel that way. Um, anyway, he did this really good video pointing out how much art today is anti-white. 
like, like, uh, explicitly, mm-hmm. you know, the guy who painted the Obama portrait, who had those other portraits of a black person chopping off the head of a white person and holding yeah. the severed head and stuff. So he was just going through and there's like this artist who just got this huge project in France at the Eiffel tower. He painted this mural on the ground and all of his art is black people slaughtering white people except for the one he did in France. Like that was different, but all the rest of his art is black figures, evil black figures, slaughtering white people. And it's very graphic and gross. And, um, and I thought it was a really, sounds wonderful. Yeah. I thought it was a really well done video and, but I didn't share it because I know if I share a video by that guy, people are going to say I'm a white separatist. Right. I can't talk about the ideas of art I can't say, hey, this video really shows, like proves how much anti-white art, which is really scary because art is kind of at the vanguard of culture. Right. And if it's acceptable to slaughter white people in high profile art, art in, in he, he was pointing out that this is going to be in the Brooklyn Museum. This is going to be in the Virginia Museum. This one is in at the Eiffel Tower in France. Like this is not obscure art. Right. And it's white slaughter. And that's a really good point. And, uh, and it needs to be said, but I can't share that video or people will paint me with the brush of white separatism. Yeah. So yep. that's the world we live in. And I, so I'm not going to share it cause I'm just, I don't want that battle. Um, exactly. Exactly. So. No. And that's, we see this all the time. It's, you know, I, I think I had made this analogy once in a post where I said, you know, would you vote for a gangster? Well, what if everybody running is a gangster? And so, you know, you don't say, well, let, what are the abstract qualities of a gangster? Well, a gangster is lawless and they're probably sociopathic and they're criminals and blah, blah, blah. Therefore, everything this person does, you know, so if we elect a gangster, right, to, you know, to some office, you you take the abstract qualities of what is a gangster and then you judge everything they do from that perspective instead of saying, well you know, who cares? In this one case, they passed a regulate or they, they passed a law that, um, stopped certain regulations or they cut taxes yeah. or whatever. No, nope, he's a gangster. <laughs> right. Remember he everything they yeah, do. Cause we hear that from people like, Oh, he didn't do it for the right reasons. Yes. <laughs> right. I right. don't care. No, because, because Trump is X, he's a gangster, yeah. you know, in my analogy, anything he does or touches or says is invalid. Right. So even if we have this context where we have a, a, an executive we've hired for a job for four years, he cuts taxes, he gets our military out of Syria, you know, he's trying to um, uh, prevent illegal immigration, you know, whatever he does, even if you're for that, you can't be for it because the abstract qualities of a gangster render everything he does, you know, that's like rationalistic thinking. Now, if you said, um, yeah, should you be worried that this guy's a gangster and he might cheat or he might lie and everything? Yeah. You keep that in mind. Yeah. The guy was a gangster. So yes, you put that in the back of your mind, but in a situation where everyone was evil and everyone was a gangster running for election, you have to say, well, all right, this guy's a little bit better than this guy and his yeah. powers are limited because if he tries to do this, someone else will take him out. And, you know, you don't, and, and this is what I see ARI doing. And it's what I see a lot of objectivist types doing is he's a liar. You know, there's this abstract concept. He's unvirtuous. Therefore, mm-hmm. anything he does is wrong. Mm-hmm. That's not the way to look at politics. Mm-hmm. When I, when he was running against Hillary and people were like, And I myself thought I didn't, my biggest problem with him was actually not his boorish behavior. I kind of, I kind of liked his pushback on PC culture, which three years later, I'm so glad he's really emboldened uh, the right. And I knew that it would be good for, I don't care what he's doing so much, but when you watch someone so high profile doing it, it emboldens other people to do it. So it's the first step toward all of us feeling more free to say what, we want what we're thinking. And so that was good. That was a positive to me, even if he came across, you know, even if he talked about the size of his penis <laughs> right. in a boorish way at a, at a, at a debate. Um, 
And I thought he might not fulfill any of his promises. I thought that he was a liar. I thought that he might be a Democrat. <laughs> I thought that he might be corrupt or become corrupt or use the office, you know, in a corrupt way. And, but I thought, well, but the media will hold him to account because the media is left. So he won't right. be able to sneeze without the media, you know, all up, all over that, which is true. Yeah, That's been totally true. true. And yep. then the second thing is, is he hadn't yet committed crimes the way Hillary had. So to me, for Hillary to be voted in after committing crimes would have been a <laughs> terrible um, blow to just the feeling of equality in this country and the rule of law. Whereas, you know, yeah, put Trump in office and if he commits crimes, then we'll go after him. You know, right. like, exactly. let's wait till he commits crimes. So maybe yeah, she, he is a gangster. She but, spent a life. Yeah. She spent a life committing crimes and we all know it. Right. So for her to be elected is like just thumbing your nose at the rule of law. It's like, right. yeah, she's corrupt. Well, but, but she's uh, elite. So she gets away with it. She's rich and she's a, an elite part of the big oligarch and a leftist. So she gets away with it. And that's so far proven true. Um, and just ridding the just ridding the federal government to whatever extent we can of the Obama Clinton yeah. types, you know, and the FBI and the CIA and the deep state. Yeah. And just think of like people like Weinstein well, and not Epstein even, not even and all these guys that got exposed. Yeah, they right. were all her friends. The sex trafficking stuff, the and not even just the left, but the right, like the Romneys and the McCains and the Bushes and those those yahoos yes. that anyway. Well, that's the end of our show today. Hey, we really want to hear from you. What do you think about Syria? If you think we're wrong, change our mind and let us know what you think. Let us know what you'd like us to talk about next week. We're always open to ideas and questions. And that's it from us today. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the House of Sunny podcast. Go check out Sunny on YouTube at her channel, House of Sunny. Everything Sunny does is fan funded. And because she's likely to get kicked off and demonetized on every platform at some point, please support her over at patreon.com slash house of Sunny. Become one of Sunny's elite squad and have access to behind the scenes footage, t-shirts, special events, and more. Uh.